Hello everyone, welcome to Agora. This is the English podcast version of my Spanish-speaking radio show. I'm your host, Gabriel Andrade. My Twitter account is at GAndrade80. Andrade is A-N-D-R-A-D-E-8080. Joining me on the other end of the line today is Professor Bruce Chilton. He is a historian of Christianity and the author of the book Abraham's Chorus. Hi, Professor. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. What's this book about? It basically concerns how it is that people experience within themselves the sense that the way to please God is to give up the thing that is most precious to them, even if it is their own child. And I investigate that impulse by considering the story of Abraham's offer to sacrifice his son Isaac in the book of Genesis. Right. So that in, in that story, well, uh, God at first promises that he's going to have uh, many offsprings, and many offsprings. after all, he, he finally gets sure. his, his son, but then all of a sudden he tells him to go and sacrifice him on, on a mountain. But at the last minute, uh, the angel appears and stops from killing him. Now, I, I won't lie here. I mean, I've always thought that this story is terrible, because, I mean, why would a God ask such a terrible thing, Right. It is a frightful command, but you know, it is a command that is very well established as part of the religious culture of the time that the story was written. Uh, we have archaeological evidence of child sacrifice during this time and before, and then there's also historical evidence within the Bible of foreign rulers trying to please God by offering their sons, even kings of Judea were known to engage in the practice. So this story is wrestling with the impulse to sacrifice one's own child to God, which was well known within the culture of that time. So can one say that perhaps the, the intent of the story is to substitute uh, child sacrifice with uh, animal sacrifice? Because, I mean, in the story, uh, eventually, the angel uh, orders Abraham to sacrifice a ram, and, you know, maybe we could see this as some sort of progression towards animal sacrifice and leaving human sacrifice behind. I think that's exactly the case. The man to the angel make it pla makes it plain that Abraham is to do nothing near to sacrificing his own child, but that now God only desires the ram as part of the regular offerings of Israel. So the conception is that within Abraham's instinct to offer his own child, there is a moment when the divine overrules him, and he realizes that child sacrifice cannot be pleasing to God, whatever he thought was the case. Right. But in your book, you uh, it's a wonderful read, uh, you later on outline how mm, in the posterior history of uh, Jew and Jewish and Christian religion, uh, the story was not interpreted as such, but rather as the idea that uh, uh, some human lives must be sacrificed in order to please God. And, you know, this is where the concept of martyrdom begins and... Uh, it, it got my my attention, especially the chapters you dedicate to the Maccabee um, re uh, rebellion in you know two centuries before the appearance of Jesus. Tell us how the story of Abraham is connected to the story of uh, of the Maccabees. The Maccabees felt that they themselves were in a position of extraordinary stress, uh, even more oppressed than Abraham had ever been during the course of his life. And they picked up on an element of the story which occurred accidentally, but which they believe showed them that really child sacrifice was required of God. And this accidental element in the story is that, as you mentioned, at the very start of Genesis chapter 22, the text says that God tested Abraham. But then, when Abraham is prevented from killing his own son... It is, in fact, an angel that intervenes. So, is there a difference between the command of God and the intervention of the angel? Is it possible that God really 
desired the sacrifice all along. It was not the intention of the story to say this. The only reason that an angel appears towards the end of the story is that there was a desire among those who framed the biblical text not to have God appear directly in a story, but to have his angelic representative. Nonetheless, the Maccabees came to the idea that, in fact, they could be, in effect, more heroic than Abraham himself by doing what God had desired all along, namely offered their young sons in their warfare with the occupying Persian monarch. Wow. And the result of that was to develop an entire literature of martyrdom, uh, which you can read very easily in the second book of Maccabees. It's a literature that specifically has parents offering their own children against the Persians in order not to defect from the Torah. Right. Well, this reminds me a bit of the Iran-Iraq war when uh, mothers would urge their children to step on mines in order to, to save the country, coming from Iran's side. So I guess these ideas are still going on in that region of the world. Uh, uh, what, what, what's they your take on it? Are, and that's right. I, I totally agree. You know, there is a direct connection between the literature of martyrdom among the Maccabees in the second century before the Common Era uh, in Judea, and then moving ahead several centuries with the literature of the Crusades, because when Pope Urban II preached the Crusades, he actually gave the example of the Maccabees as why it is that Christians should be able to go out and to battle against the Muslims. And then today, within the literature of jihad, uh, as I show within the book, Muslim clerics also, those who are urging people to violent acts, often use the example of Ibrahim. And what they are doing is tapping into exactly the same story, which has its own version within the Quran. This is a very uh, complex issue because, uh, I mean, I hear Muslim apologists say all the time that the Quran does not really invite violence, but rather that they are crooked interpretation. What's your take? What does the Quran really say? I think that within the interpretation of the Quran, like the interpretation of Genesis and the interpretation of the New Testament, there has always been a battle about this story. So that, of course, I personally prefer the interpretations which show that the divine intent is to refuse child sacrifice. But I can't deny that there has been a long tradition in the three Abrahamic religions of using this story in order to argue that martyrdom is the most important virtue of them all. It is part of what we grapple with inside our religious traditions. And those of us who believe that the impetus towards martyrdom, and especially the impetus to having parents encourage their children to be martyrs, is a crooked interpretation, I think need to find the resources to explain why it is that really that idea doesn't fit Judaism or Christianity or Islam. It's not simply a silly idea that can be easily dismissed. It truly is deep within our scriptures, and you need to get into those texts to see how they were framed, to understand why they have been interpreted in the way that they have, and then you can begin to move away from this deadly impetus. Right. I, I can see that these ideas are ever-present, even in modern times, and even in the Western world. I'm thinking, for instance, of the 19th century philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, you know, that famous book, Fear and Trembling. I mean, there are many ways to read that book, but in my view, it's an awful book because, I mean, it seems to reaffirm the idea that uh, God would require of Abraham such a terrible thing and that if Abraham hesitated about doing that, he, he's lacking faith. Now, in a sense, as I read Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard is saying, you know, faith is doing what's absurd. 
Faith is about, uh, you know, letting God be in charge, even if it means killing your own child. So I, I'm, I really get disturbed when, you know, a, a philosopher who seems very, very rational or, or, or and very calm and, you know, not prone to violence writes this type of book. Uh, what, what's your take on fear and trembling? Yeah, I do criticize Kierkegaard for exactly that take on Abraham, because here's an example of someone moving from a single biblical story and not looking at its context. As I point out, Kierkegaard simply wants to make Abraham completely into a knight of faith, right. as he puts it, someone who completely trusts in God. But in fact, within the book of Genesis, it's very clear that Abraham is not an entirely noble character. Uh, before this story has occurred, while he was traveling, he had attempted to pass off his wife, Sarah, as his sister, right. uh, so as to avoid any kind of conflict. This at a time when Sarah was pregnant with Isaac. Uh, before this story, uh, he had also driven out his older son by Hagar, the slave woman, and Hagar herself, and they nearly died, except for an angelic intervention. And then finally, immediately before this story occurs, Abraham is portrayed as entering into a covenant with a local ruler, not with God, but with a local ruler. Part of the point of the story is that Abraham, in fact, is not a completely noble character. He has some extremely strange ideas, most of them rooted in the culture of the time. And the story in Genesis 22 really turns on the way it is possible for the power of prophecy to overcome those old instincts and to make something new and healthy out of them. So I think that Kierkegaard really mistook the purpose of this story. Uh, even if you compare what Kierkegaard does with Abraham with what rabbinic literature does, it's very clear that Kierkegaard has an amazingly idealistic take on Abraham. Right. So you're basically saying, I mean, the whole thesis of the whole book is that uh, Genesis 22 is actually about substitution of sacrifice from child sacrifice to, let's say, animal sacrifice but that in later ages, this story was not interpreted accordingly and was mistaken instead of saying that, you know, God does require sacrifice and, you know, that's the final word. We have to do what God says, right? And we have to put up with that, exactly. And as right. you rightly say, there's a kind of secular version of that kind of message in the way in which in many countries, certainly in the United States today, any kind of death in the military is referred to as a sacrifice right. and made to be ennobled. And part of the terrible logic of this reflex of martyrdom is that once a death of that kind occurs, you have the sense that, therefore, the war, whatever war it is, must be right. Right. Now, this, so, uh, the, the, this seems to be deeply ingrained also in Christianity. I mean, so far we have criticized Judaism and Islam. We haven't really touched much on Christianity. But there are some characters that you point out in your book that, whoa, I, I find them quite disturbing. For instance, Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, here's this man who's on route to Rome to be fed to the lions. And it's not so clear that he's a prisoner all the time because, I mean, apparently he moves with some freedom in order to write letters to, you know, his uh, fellow comrades on, in religion and throughout the region, and yet he's very happy to be fed to the lions. Now, I mean, this is, to me, this is a very crooked feeling. Why would you be happy to be fed to the lions? I mean, wh wh what are you going to achieve with that? There is no doubt but that there was a glorification of martyrdom within the early church, uh, so much so that the motto began to be repeated, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That is, the more you, you strike down believers, the more the cause is ennobled because of the way in which they die heroically. And the result was that just as in the second century before the Common Era, you had a rich literature of martyrdom in Judaism, 
you had just such a literature in Christianity from the second century of the Common Era, when there was so much encouragement for martyrdom that you can actually see attempts to turn the volume down, uh, especially so that people who were very, very young did not attempt to get themselves martyred deliberately. Right. Now, there has been some historical revisionism in throughout the recent years, and I'm thinking particularly of scholar Candida Moss, who say that, well, yes, this ideology was there, but the numbers were not as high as maybe early Christian propaganda presented them. Would you agree? Would you agree? I think that there is a degree of exaggeration in the early literature of martyrdom. I mean, if you read, for example, the church history of Eusebius, which was written in the 4th century, you would get the impression that there were massive persecutions throughout the Roman Empire in every century since the death of Christ. In fact, what we know now is that for the most part, with very few occasions, persecution of Christians tended to be a local event. However, within those localities, it could be very fierce because it involved not only official persecution, but also very often the action of mobs in pogroms. Right. So I would say that right. it was sporadic and local rather than empire-wide. Would you say that this uh, sense of uh, martyrdom, this ideology of martyrdom, has the side effect of encouraging paranoia? I mean, feeling persecuted when you're actually not persecuted. I think it certainly did that, because something very interesting happened when Christianity was recognized as a legal religion during the 4th century, uh, under the time of Constantine. Once it became legal, and then eventually became the official religion of Rome, there was a tendency to glorify the martyrs of the past, and then to say it would be possible to continue the same attitude of a martyr, even when one is in power. And the result of that was that you had praises of Christian believers as martyrs when they died in the Roman army, right. fighting a battle on the, the empire. So that you have the martyrdom reflex made much deeper with the notion that you don't really even have to be an actual martyr. You simply have to have the same attitude, and then you achieve that righteousness, and therefore its reward. That's one of the ways in which the attitude of martyrdom becomes self-reinforcing. You have the sense that, I don't even have to suffer. I simply have to risk suffering, and then I know that I'm righteous. Right. No, My I must... willingness to army. I must say this is a wonderful book, but there might be a few things over which we may have some disagreement, and I want to point them out in, in our final phase of this podcast, which is, look, I'm more on the side of the atheist here. I, along with Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and all, all those other people that you mentioned in your book, I tend to agree with them that religion drives people to do some crazy things. Yet in the book, you say this is not necessarily the case. Now, expand your case. Oh, of course. I'm happy to. And, and first, let me say that although you may agree with Dawkins, the agreement is not complete because you don't fall into the camp of people to say, I don't believe in God and I'm really angry at him. <laughs> it seems to me that this is the problem of the recent atheist critique, uh, that it's it kind of gets an evangelical fury uh, against the very idea of God. But what I would say in this regard is that it is true that religions, and it's not only the Abrahamic religions, all religions at one time or another have been involved in war, have engaged in violence, and have offered justifications for that. Moreover, because our scriptures are so ancient, what we have inside them, if we read them properly, is the equivalent of an archaeological tell of the human spirit. We can see how people have reacted under varying cultures going back to the second millennium 
before the common era. That's when this impulse to child sacrifice emerged. Inside those scriptures, we will find not only the awful story of how it is that the impulse to child sacrifice was encouraged, we'll also find how it is that these religions learned to reverse that tendency. That's precisely what Genesis 22 is doing, because the impulse is not simply associated with religion as such. The idea that you have to sacrifice what is most valuable to you is a very ancient, I would say, Paleolithic conception. And if you don't address it in some way or another, you will find that it will emerge. There are many, many cases today of violence that have absolutely nothing to do with religion. There have been huge wars fought, including those on genocidal proportions, which have been ideologically motivated, even from an atheist ideology. Right. You know, Stalin many more people than Al Qaeda could dream of. Well, so, some, some people I mean, some people would say that that Stalin himself was a religious figure. I mean, that's what Daniel Dennett says, for instance. He 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 promoted some sort of cult, and in that sense, that's a civil religion. Yeah, that's right. There's an example of having your cake and eating it too. I mean, that <laughs> is, you say all all violence is religious, and therefore. Even figures who are against religion, like Stalin and Hitler, must at some level or another be religious. And so you say, oh, I know, Stalin once went to a seminary, and <laughs> that's the reason that he attempted to wipe out the population of the Ukraine. It's a kind of slippery logic which could enable you to blame anyone for anything if you apply those kind of categories. Right. Professor Bruce Chilton, thank you so much for taking our call. It's been my pleasure to speak with you. All right.